It's time for the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast, answering your questions from the General's Quarters every week, right here on BallQuest. Good Thursday, everybody, and welcome into it. This is the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast. You got awesome price, Rob Lewis. Brent Hubbs, I am Eric Kane, just two days away until it's football time in Tennessee, and Tennessee takes on the Florida Gators. One dollar for one year. The deal is still going on. One dollar for one year. It won't last forever, so if you're listening and you're not a member of the Ball Quest community, I encourage you. No better time to do it than now uh, for Florida Week, and of course, uh, continue to subscribe, hit the like button, and follow us on YouTube as well. Gentlemen, we got tons and tons of questions, obviously, with this being a big showdown, Tennessee and Florida, so let's jump right into it. Athron wants to know, gut feeling, Austin Price, on September the 22nd, does Tennessee get David Hobbs? <laughs> Can I keep laughing? Uh, you know, I think a lot AP, of people will percentage, what, percentage what happens. I mean, like, I think that this is the kind of thing where, like, in most instances, most recruitments, you want the last visit, right? In this instance, I think a big-time atmosphere, a win, and, I mean, somebody's going to say, well, they don't have to win. Yeah, they kind of do, in my opinion. Like, I, I think you, 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 you need to win and keep that atmosphere all the way through the weekend where it's just a straight party in Knoxville. And uh, if you don't win, then, you know, it's going to be a funeral, come 7.30 tomorrow night. So you win, you can ride that wave, a tsunami of momentum all the way the rest of the fall. You know, I, I really do think that. So I think this weekend will go a long way to determining uh, everything with David Hobbs. You know, Alabama and Tennessee are the top two teams, in my opinion. I think Georgia is running three um, and North Carolina is running four. Um, but Georgia's, you know, right there, they're just below Tennessee and Alabama, in my opinion. Now, some people are going to say it's Georgia and Alabama. I don't agree with that. But um, I think it's Tennessee and, and Alabama, the top two teams for David Hobbs. And Tennessee's got a real shot this weekend to set the standard for the rest of the official visits this fall. So, AP, I'm hearing 53%. Is that is that about right? 52.7. Okay. I'm, I, I'm good with that. Got a couple more recruiting questions here uh, from the same poster. Deshaun Bishop or a transfer in terms of a second running back in this class? Um, th- those two those two possibilities still realistic for Tennessee? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think Deshaun Bishop, if you said, send your own the 22nd of September, I would give it a better than 50% shot Deshaun Bishop ends, in, ends up in this class. What about other defensive tackle targets on the board besides Hobbs and Elijah Davis? Well, those two are at the top. You know, they can, you know, push, you know, Parker, you know, he's going to be kind of like a Tyler Barron who can kind of slide inside. Um, you know, I think Tennessee will continue to, to work, you know, senior film. And they'll continue to, uh, you know, look at different players. They offered Dijon Lafitte. Um, I've really got to get with that kid and make sure that's how he says his name. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like this French flair on it. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll get to talk to him next week. Um, but he's a defensive tackle. So, um, you know, Tennessee's, you know, going to go the JUCO slash transfer portal slash senior film route, um, you know, with, with that position. Brent Hubs, this is from Gator Dog. Any thoughts on the backups in the secondary? Anyone stepping up? No, I mean, I think you've seen everybody that's healthy play. I think you saw them last week. Um, you know, you got D. Williams, who's got the shoulder injury. He's out. Um, I don't know when he'll be back. Uh, Warren Burrell's banged up. So, I mean, I don't know that there's any backups really left to play that you haven't seen. You saw Turnage play last week. You saw, saw Rucker play last week. Obviously, Kamal Haddon. Uh, as a starter, Christian Charles started. You know where you're at in, in the, at the safety position. Andre Turntine's backing up there. You could move Wesley Walker in to play safety if you wanted to. But you know who your top two are at the start position as well, and Tamari and McDonald and, and Wesley Walker. I, I don't know that there's anybody else out there who we haven't seen in terms of backup stepping up. I think Willie Martinez has pretty much played everybody healthy um, that, that he's had through, through three games. Maybe he didn't play as many in the pit game, but – you look at what he's done at Ball State. You look at what he did um, in the Akron game. They pretty much played the roster. They're, they're not a whole lot else out there floating around options-wise. 
Well, Blues, let's go to you. This is from Billing Vol. Any chance that Squirrel White takes over punt return duty in Tennessee, uh, continue to allow penetration on punt team, even against Akron, what is the deal with that? I think the operation has just been slow, but I, I would like to see Squirrel White take over punt return duties, but I'm, I'll, I'll be surprised, especially this week. I mean, I know he flashed a little on punt return, but I just – I, I don't see that, H- Hubbard. I would I would like your cons- your conservative take on that. I, I'm I'm channeling my inner hub and saying no, they don't risk it. You know the the one thing about Score White that gives you the thought that they might do it is the decision making he made back there in the Akron game on fair catch and punts. I mean he he was he didn't just try to return everything. He wasn't a guy that you put back there and you know he was trying to go to the house with every one of them. And he made pretty solid decisions. Um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, my conservative nature says they probably don't do it. I would do it because I don't think he did anything in terms of how he fielded a punt to give you reservation about his ability to field punts, but you, you know, you didn't put him back there in the ball state game. So it's not like you've been working to get him to that point. You certainly have felt like Trayvon flowers was your guy all along. So, so maybe they go with Trayvon flowers or maybe they do it a little bit like they did last year depending on where the ball is being kicked from, you know, field position wise, there were times they went punt safe and ended up with Trayvon Flowers in the back end fielding a punt instead of Bayless Jones. So they could do a little bit of a, of, of a hybrid. But my best, my guess is first punt of the game, Trayvon Flowers is returning it Saturday. Yeah, but I mean, that was with the defense on the field though, right, Brent? There was a lot of punt safe, you know. There was, there was a couple of times that they did it, you know, and then there was a couple of times they tried to do it. They got the wrong – they got double numbers on the field and – messed it up as well because uh, you know both of them were wearing number one but generally when it was punt safe somebody's at midfield punting you're guarding against a fake that's when they would put flowers back there so they may do something like that but again if I were if I were betting man I would probably bet flowers on the punt, first punt return awesome price let's go back to you this is from Vol in SC any other guys that didn't get bumps that are committed outplaying the rankings and could get a bump in the future yeah, I think Jalen Smith, and we talked about that with Charles uh, when we did the piece uh, when the rankings came out on Monday. Um, you know, he's someone that I think will, you know, continue to put up big numbers there at Grayson. He'll have a chance the next time the rankings come out to get a bump, um, in my opinion. The, the, I also think Trevor Duncan and Nathan Robinson are guys that are intriguing, especially Duncan to Charles Power. And I, I think that, that that's someone who could. But, you know, Trevor just got back on the field last week. He's going to have to play really well the rest of the way, in my opinion, to get that fourth star. A second part of this question, this is for uh, all you guys. What is the loudest game each of you guys have attended at Neyland Stadium? Oh, I think that Oklahoma game was really loud for the entire game. Loudest moment for me was the 98 Arkansas game after the Sterner fumble. Yep. That's the loudest moment. I won't say that's the loudest game because Tennessee didn't play well, and there was a lot of Tennessee fans gnashing the teeth, a lot of people walking out, getting ready to walk out of the stadium on the fourth down pass from T. Martin to Peerless Price that was incomplete. But in terms of a single moment, in game, I got to go Arkansas 98. Will Hoyt's kick against Florida was pretty loud, pretty doggone loud, too, uh, when he made that one, Rob. Yeah, I was going to say, I would say Oklahoma that, that year until Butch sucked the life out of the stadium when he was too too afraid to go for it on fourth and one right right in the first quarter. And just Hell is momentum. old as time. And um, what about what what year did Monterio have the great run against Cal? Was that 06? Oh, oh, 06. That, yeah. that, that, that would blew the lid off, off, off Neyland pretty good, too. All those are great, and, and and I agree with all of them. Now, Vol moment as far as non football, it wasn't actually. It was not even the. It was not the Durant, uh, the the Lofton shot over Durant. It was the subsequent five second violation in TBA that that that'll always live with me. Like it was so loud in TBA. But for football, I agree with Hubs. I was there, obviously, uh, a much younger, much younger version of myself uh, in '98. And uh, the the Sterner fumble was, I mean, it, it it shook, it shook the place. Yeah, I was on the field at that point and was doing an update on ESPN, getting ready to do an update on on ESPN Radio. I was trying to make as 
you know, every every 10, 20 bucks here along the way counted at that point in my life. Eric, you've been there. You We've wait, all you been there. You got cell service on the field? Yeah, I did back then. I had some cell service. And all I remember is there was a guy, His name, I think his name was Ted Gandy. Uh, strange I remember his name, or Ganji or something like that. <laughs> that and all I heard was go. Uh, I just heard go, and that's the only thing I could hear. And I just started talking. I have no idea if I ever got on the air or not. Uh, but I was just I was on the field waiting for that game to be over. And was just told go, and um, it just—I mean, it, it was just a roar like you haven't heard for 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 that particular moment for sure. That is hey, one of the worst can you, feelings. Can you imagine how long it took like Cover in 19, 1998 to dry his hair after, after that game? Oh, it was like that was probably like a two or three towel job. <laughs> he was he was up there with Dennis Tomlin on the, up there on the on the goalpost. No goalpost for me. That's one of the worst feelings when you're doing TV or radio or whatever, and like you can't hear what's coming down the line. Yeah, or whatever. I agree. Like the producers and, in your ear saying, "Go, go, go!" go. <laughs> you just what don't know. Uh, we got a couple here from Sam Smith, twenty-two thirty-three. Uh, another punt question, Rob. Do we see anything different on punts this week, or is it just going to be the same thing and, and holding your breath until they figure that thing out? I, you said it a moment ago. I c- I completely agree. It looks like Pax and Brooks, and again, I'm not a punter, but it looks like his operation's just been a little little slower you know so far this year i'm not saying that there hadn't been miscues in front of them because there has been but it just looks really slow right now yeah and i just have i, I have a very hard time thinking they can't get that fixed just because i mean he's i mean he's been doing it forever and do you ever remember it being a problem in the past and i mean and, and maybe it just got highlighted because of the block and now yeah. we're all paying attention to it we'll, we'll, i don't rob i didn't mean to interrupt you no, i, I don't have ever, I don't have any idea what that first punt was against Akron. Was that supposed to be a rugby style yeah. that Paxton just decided to yes. stop and plant and kick? Because they the, the the personal protector on the left, which would have been the inside protector, turned his inside guy loose because he's blocking. The, I guess where the where the rugby style where the run's supposed to go for the rugby style, and and he stopped and set up and punt there, and that's why it nearly got blocked. So I I mean. You're either going to rugby style it or you're not going to rugby style it. That wasn't a real rugby style kick, so I'm not real sure what they were trying to do on that one. Uh, they obviously had a bust in the pit game, but but that 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 unit's clearly not been on the same page and not been playing fast enough, uh, really through all three games. I mean, Ball State got close to one as well. Nobody wanted to talk about that, but that they got close to one, and then obviously Pitt came and got that one, and they about got one block last week as well. I bet Florida comes after multiple kicks on Saturday. Yeah, no, I mean, right. it's been a true hold your breath moment um, for sure. Because again, you've had one block, but you've had nearly one block, if not blocked in every single game so far this year. Uh, another one here from Sam Smith. Uh, Brent, is the strategy against Anthony Richardson just to drop eight and keep all eyes on him? I would say no. This is an aggressive defense. They're not going to change anything. They were dialing it up against Akron. They're going to go after him. I understand what he's saying. Make him throw the football because he hadn't done it so far this year, but also spying on him to make sure he doesn't run. But Tennessee's going to continue to be aggressive on defense. Well, it depends on yes, they are, and it also depends on down and distance, right? I mean, if you got him in third and long, I, I can see rush three, drop eight, and, yeah. and and see if he can can pick you apart that way. Uh, the problem is if you turn and drop eight, then you're going to give up some run or some running lanes too. So, you know, may, maybe you you rush three, spy, and drop seven, you know, and, and change it up a little bit that way. So, I, I think you'll see them mix it up, but they're not just going to let him stand back there and pat the ball. Uh, they'll they'll come after him in a variety of different ways. That's why you've heard Tyler Barron and others talk about, you know, playing the, the, the proper rush lanes and, and use containment when they rush the quarterback. But they're going to come after Anthony Richardson. They're not just going to let him stand back there and try to get comfortable. Rice Trout, if Tillman is out, Austin Price, do you expect the staff to plug in one receiver to replace him or stick with three guys for most of the game or rotate a few guys to fill a Tillman spot? I, in my opinion, Austin, you can tell me if you disagree. They'll – if Tillman is out, I think they can do a different, a couple of different things. Like we mentioned, uh, maybe toy with brew on the other side, Hyatt maybe outside, get another slot, but I think it'll be a Ramel Keaton and a, and a Walker Merrill show, you know, kind of trying to replace that one side of the field. If Tillman is out. Yeah. I, I think they're going to, they'll, they'll shift everything for brew to the right. They'll put yeah. the other guys on the left. I mean, that's clearly how they kind of want to roll. Um, yeah. They, they can offer different combinations. As you, you pointed out, Hyatt to the outside, put Squirrel in the slot. But you know, I think Brew will get all of the or most of the uh, the Tillman targets. 
As he should. As he should. Coach underscore 93, Rob, will go to you. I know it's Florida week, but after watching the first three weeks of the season, has your overall record prediction changed for Tennessee? I, I'm the only one of you like pessimists that, that picked nine and three, so I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. We got the, the pit game was a huge one to, to get out of the way, to get to get to nine and three. I, I thought they would beat Florida. I still think that. So no, I mean I'm 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 still I'm I'm on the nine and three wagon. I, but, I don't I don't know about you naysayers. Be, better said, let's just go to Austin because we know what Brett will say. Let's just go to Austin with this one then. What's this now? <laughs> I, would, <laughs> after, I would think six and six is still on the table. After watching the win, first three games, is your... Saturday. If they win Saturday, yeah. eight and four is the absolute worst they can do. Like I'm talking like wheels fall off. Bad, bad, bad. Eight and four if they win Saturday. If they if they don't win Saturday, then I think you know seven and five is still you know so to me like seven and five is the floor with a loss, eight and four is the floor with a win. But I think like again eight and four with a, with a win eight and four is like if everything goes wrong like I think nine and three is probably what they do and and potentially better than that depending on <clears throat> sorry the uh, the LSU game, the Kentucky game like th- those are all these type of swing games but I mean like. You know, they're beating Missouri with you, uh, us four playing. They're beating Vandy with us four playing. South Carolina, you know, we may need to add uh, another member to the staff, but we probably could beat them. Uh, and, of course, I'm just having fun. But, I mean, like, those teams do nothing that scare you and have shown nothing to this point where you're like, man, Tennessee will have to really play well to beat Team X. Now, Kentucky, they're going to have to play well. Kentucky's a good, solid football team. You know, LSU on the road potentially at night, you know. I do think that the fact that CBS is looking at doing a doubleheader that day helps Tennessee because when you look at that list of games, I think Tennessee LSU is probably the second best game. So maybe 3.30. 3.30 is better than 7. Especially for us, am I right? Uh, one bo- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with our flight times. Yeah. Woof. Uh, Brent, let's go to you right here. One ball fan wants to know, will Tennessee run draw or screen pass to the running backs this game, or does Tennessee even have those in the playbook? Can't remember Tennessee doing either one of those in a long time. They've thrown it out. They threw it first play of the game. They threw it to Jabari Small. That wasn't a screen, but um, they threw it to him out of the backfield. But do you see any draws or or screens for Tennessee this week? I could see draws for sure. Uh, I mean, I can see I can see quarterback draw. I yeah, mean, I, I yeah. think there's definitely going to be some quarterback draw in there. Uh, in terms of an old school traditional draw, like we saw Jamal Lewis break off against Ole Miss or whatever years ago, I, I don't know that you'll see a lot of that. Um, you're in the shotgun, you know, it's different, uh, you know, and I think from a screen stuff that, you know, their screen package is a wide receiver screen. They've just got to figure out when they can block downfield, when they can't block downfield on the screen so that they don't get a, per- a pass interference penalty, which they've had the last two games. They got to get their timing a little better on those plays. Uh, but I think if you're talking about the screen game, I think it would be wide receiver screens, not a running back screen. Also, let's go back to you. This is from volunteer at 87. Uh, any recruits you expect to publicly get in the boat uh, before leaving town? I don't think so there. Or is it going to be more of a big weekend that might pay dividends a month or two down the line? I, I think that's where you are, especially with, you know, with Hobbs and, and with Lang, who's going to be in here. And, you know, Ray will come uh, Alabama. Uh, he's not really a factor this weekend, but really those two guys. Exactly. That you hit the nail on the head. Like, you know, I mean, I do think Tennessee with a big weekend uh, becomes the leader for Vice and Lang. Um, and, and, you know, I think he maybe does something sooner rather than later in terms of like, I don't think he's waiting till November, December. Um, but I don't think he's leaving the weekend committing, but you know, I mean, stranger things have happened. I mean, you just kind of get in that mode and you feel the love, but I would say no. Um, but I mean, like this weekend's a big weekend just for, you know, not only those handful of 24s that are in town, but you know, the 25s, um, or the 24s, the handful of 23s that are in town, but the 24s and 25s. I mean, you got all those kids from Chattanooga coming in. You got Cameron Sparks, all the, the 25 will be in. All the, all the kids from Nashville coming in. You got some big timers from other states. So, yeah, I mean, you want to, you want to do well in front of, you know, Ryan Wingo for a second straight week, right? I mean, you got Arian Carter coming in. You got five star Sammy Brown coming in. You know, th- these are all players that, you know, you'd like to kind of, start the, your, their own wave of momentum with. 
let's get off the beaten path for just a second. Aaron Carter, Tennessee offered him. He's a Memphis commit. Tell us a little bit about him and how and I, I, a lot of other teams like Alabama has jumped in the boat here recently as well. What, what's what's his deal? Well, a kid that was recruited as a running back and didn't have much linebacker film, and then once he got linebacker film, started getting offers. Vanderbilt offered first. Auburn offered last th- uh, Friday. Alabama Saturday. USC Sunday. Tennessee, Ole Miss, Kentucky on Monday. He's had Michigan, Michigan State, LSU. I mean, like, I think they get run here lately. The kid's head is swimming, as it should be, right? I mean, you know, he's saying all the right things. He talked to Chad. He told Chad I'm still committed to Memphis. That's what he should be saying, you know. But at the same time, acknowledging, you know, I'm just looking to see what my best options are. Well, his options are a lot better than Memphis at this point. So, um, you know, the kid's not going to end up at Memphis. He's going to end up playing football likely in this league. And, uh, you know, so, like, I've got got several questions, like, how could Tennessee be this late? Well, I mean, everybody was this late. I mean, like, it's – you know, um, Tennessee has started watching him. They started putting him on eval lists. Problem is, is like, you know, it's much like it's easier for Tennessee to throw out an offer to a kid from North Carolina or Georgia over Georgia or North Carolina throwing out an offer. It's easier for schools not in this state to throw out an offer to kids in this state. And so, um, you know, Tennessee, again, was what, fourth in line, I guess, or whatever it was. Um you know, everything will be fine. I don't think Tennessee's, you know, behind. Now, they may not get him. You know, I mean, he's going to have plenty of options. But Tennessee, I would not call behind at, you know, this Thursday. Let's see with recruiting, but more of kind of a big picture note, Rob. UT Ball fan 29, in your opinion, um, how long does it set a position group back when you have one or two really bad recruiting classes? I mean, a couple of years. But it's. I will also say that it's easier – to rectify your mistakes now more than ever because of the transfer portal. I mean, you, you can whiff on a couple, you can totally whiff on a class and then, you know, sit, be sitting there in August or September going, man, we shouldn't have taken that guy. We should have taken that guy. And boom, you know, in December, January, February, you can start working the transfer portal. So it's because of that, it's not the disaster that it used to be. I mean, I mean, it's still bad. But it's you, you can fix it so much easier now because of the transfer portal. Just watch one, two, three. I noticed Nimrod on the sidelines, not dressed out. Been high on this one since he signed. Is Tennessee looking at redshirting him? Of course, he is injured right now. Um, seems unlikely he starts playing during conference play. Uh, Brent Hubbs, at Nimrod. If he missed a couple more weeks, I would assume that's just going to be a redshirt. Of course, you can play in four games, but he's been banged up to start the season after a good spring and a good camp. He wasn't going to be like one of the top three, four guys, but they liked what they saw in him. They, they did. They haven't played Caleb Webb either. So yeah. they, you know, and Caleb Webb's been dressed. Uh, Nimrod's hurt. I don't know when he'll be back. Uh, I think if you see him play this year, it would be like in the UT Martin game, and he could still redshirt. So yeah, I mean, I think redshirting makes the most sense for him. Because, again, he can play in four games. He's not going to be ready to play against LSU or Alabama unless they just have a total rash of injuries where he has to play. I think you could see him later in the year play two to four games and still redshirt. AP, let's give an update. This is from Loud Noises. Uh, what's the latest with Robinson, with Tate, with uh, Mpemba? Um, Roderick Robinson – going to take an official visit here sometime uh, before December, in my opinion, maybe the Kentucky week. Um, you know, Tennessee had loved to push him into December, but it certainly sounds like he's wanting to do all of his officials in season. Um, and Pimba, you know, Tennessee's still talking to him. I just don't hear a whole lot of traction there, but I mean, they're still, they're still definitely recruiting him. Uh, Carnell Tate still recruiting him again. If he don't make it back to campus, they got zero shot. He's got to make it back here uh, for a visit. I was just saying, Rod, will, will Roderick Robinson really go to UCLA? Is, is no, he there's the zero chance shot? of that happening. They, uh, they, their boat was sank when they left for the Big Ten, and he's just – I mean, there's no point to, like, you just say you're – He just hasn't committed decommitted yet. Yeah, yeah, correct. You know, I mean, I mean, I would have decommitted last weekend based on the fact that, that you know, there were more of us than there were fans. At there, the were, there were probably more people in this high, high school game. There are more people outside at the flea market that goes on around the, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena on game day than there was in, in, the, in the field, I can promise you that, or inside the stadium. I've seen it. There's nobody there for that deal. 
Phew, that's bad luck. Real bad luck. Bonus question here. Aiden Williams still planning on visiting Tennessee? I'll go no, no. Okay. Uh, let's move on. This is a couple of good ones here from Noel Chucky underscore Vol. Rob, let's start with you. Which win against Florida was more impressive, 98 or 01? Uh, I mean, I'd go, I have to go 98. I mean, uh, oh, one, I mean, Tennessee's 01 team was was better, I, I think. More, I mean, more talented. But, I mean, I, it kind of it felt like an underdog to me in, in, in 98. Even though, you know, that, that team ended up winning the national championship, it's still, you know, Peyton's gone. You know, T's well, – was that T's third or fourth game as a starter, Hubbard? And he hadn't he hadn't looked great. That was his second game as a starter, right? Oh, well, they played Syracuse, and then they come home to play to play Florida. Okay. Well, there um, you go. I mean, and, and he had not – you know, had, had, didn't exactly have command of the position. And, you know, 0-1, I mean, they had had a great year. All they were right. a I mean, they, they, one underdog at the Swamp. I know, but they still looked like a really good team. I mean, you had, you, you had some players – I mean, he did 98, too, but it just – I mean, they had just beaten the best player you've had in the history of university, you know, four years in a row in, in, in 98. 98 felt, felt bigger to me. Well, I, I mean, I think I, I think with all the pressure on you with, with the, the streak and all the Spurrier, Philip can't beat Spurrier deal, 98 was a bigger hurdle to cross to get over the – to get over the hump. It was a bigger win, had a, had a bigger magnitude – but because of the fact that you finally beaten, you had finally beaten the nemesis, so to speak. Oh, uh, one with everything that was on the line um, was an impressive win. That was a really good Florida team too. I mean, that was that was a playoff game. You talk about December playoff games. That was a semifinal playoff game. Now we know what Tennessee did the next week, but you walked out of that that deal going one of those two teams. The winner of that game is going to win the national championship, is what you felt like. So. Uh, they were both impressive in different ways. I think the mental hurdle in 98 was more impressive because you were trying to get over something and do something you just hadn't been able to do. By the way, before we move on to the next question, <laughs> the Jabbar Gavney video is on Twitter this week. I, 20 years later, 22 years later, like how in the hell did anybody – let a touchdown. I mean, that is just some of the worst officiating. I mean, we all knew it at the time, but like, it, it, like just going back and watching it 20 years later, you're just like, my God, that's so bad. They'd slow the game down for 30 minutes and still have to really, really think about it. You know, if it was, if it was today, in my opinion, uh, on the flip side of that two part question, which loss against Florida was more shocking in terms of Tennessee having more talents for in hubs 97 or 2015? Well, that Florida team in 97 was a good team. Okay. I mean, I, the, the idea that that was not a good team in 97 down there. Um, I mean, that was, I mean, that Florida was coming off a national championship. They still had a lot of good players in 97. Uh, they had some young players, but they had, they had a lot of NFL talent there. Uh, so I, I would not say that. I mean, the 2015 game, I mean, you look at Butch's deal, and I'm not going to pile on Butch. That's Rob's job. Um, but in in tw- in 2014, might have been the most, might have been the worst loss of them all. They lost 10-9 to a quarterback who couldn't throw the ball. I mean, all they had to do was run the ball and punt it and play field position football and say, "Hey, drive it 80 yards," which they didn't do. They go for a home run ball, turn it over, give Florida a short field, and get beat 10-9. They, they, they should have won the game in 2014. They should have won the game in 2015. They did win the game in 2016, right? Is, is my years right yeah. there? Um, and they should have won the game in 2017. I mean, he should have beat. I mean, Butch should have beat Florida four t- four years in a row and had a contract extension that made it really hard to get rid of him. Uh, it's, it's tough to beat a Treon Harris led Florida team. I couldn't think of that quarterback's name if I wanted to. Well Treon done, Treon Harris. That's a great, that's a great it's, pull. It's tough to beat a Treon Harris led offense. That, I heard that, his name earlier that, this week and forgot he existed. Yeah, that 10-9 loss was a bad loss at home. I mean, because they, they couldn't do anything, and you served it up to them at midfield because you wanted a kill shot, which you didn't need. Punt the football, make them drive it 90 yards, which they couldn't do. Awesome. This is from Hard Hat Vol. Um, what's up with uh, Charlie Browder? Is he going to be out again this weekend? I mean, he's he went down um, in, in game one. Of course, he, he entered to the, the season as Tennessee's third tight end as – um, they continue to try to find a third tight end. He hadn't seen the field since, hadn't dressed since. Every time I ask, they say he's still banged up. Um, 
but Browder, is this, is this in your opinion, going to be a long-term thing, or will you see him back in a couple weeks? I mean, I, I think he gets back, but I think he's not back this week. And I think, Hunter, Ball, I think Hunter's the third tight end on this roster, even when Browder gets back. I think Hunter Salmon's the third tight end. He's earned it. Yeah, earned it now. It didn't open that way, but yeah, I mean, with Browder being out, of course. Uh, Henderson Vall, 15. Rob, even if Tillman can play, do you anticipate him being mostly used situationally? If Tillman can play, Rob, this is my opinion. If Tillman can play, he's playing. Yeah, I don't he, think they're going to use him as a decoy or situationally or, or whatever. D- do you differ on that? No, I totally agree with you, EC. If he, if he, if he can go, you put a saddle on him and, and ride him. I mean, he's, he's, he, he's your guy at wide out. Yeah. Uh, CN 31, Brent Hubs. Tennessee misses the Bayless passes where he could just take a small pass for a big gain. Any reason Tennessee doesn't give Holiday some similar throws to take advantage of his speed? He had one, he had a good showing in game one and then has disappeared on offense. Holiday didn't have the wiggle Bayless Jones had. When you're going to throw those things out there, that, that guy's got to wiggle. He's got to be able to make miss people miss. Holiday's got speed. He's a straight line, straight line runner. There's a reason why he's not the punt return guy, but he is the kickoff return guy. Kickoff return guy is a straight line speed. You got to trust the hole's going to be there and you got to hit it. Punt return guy's got to make somebody miss in, in open space. Holiday just doesn't have the wiggle that Bayless Jones had. They like Callaway. They wanted to get the ball to Callaway. It was pretty obvious they were trying to force it to Callaway in that game. And then Callaway decided he wanted to go Rocky, MMA, UCF, whatever, you know, UFC, whatever you call all that stuff, and, and get himself suspended for a half. I just – they didn't trust him a year ago. He's done nothing to earn Tennessee's trust this year with, with what he did on Saturday. Why do we see it at every level, guys punching helmets? It's the stupidest thing. Yeah, if you're going to go down that road, you rip their helmet off get and up under. you lay on them. Oh, like, it makes what, no sense. I mean, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> like well, it sounds like you have a play at AP. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to do something that's going to hurt the other guy if I'm going to throw a punch, not not hurt myself. Like, We're going to be on robbery Thursday this week. AP's going to be like, here's what I would do in that situation. <laughs> uh, let's keep moving on. A couple more here. Rocky Top Rowdy 58. Uh, Tennessee's defensive identity has been coming after people. Florida struggling to pass the ball and not having wide receivers that scare you, it seems that that matchup um, of their O versus Tennessee's D is actually a really good one for Tennessee. Thoughts on that, uh, Rob? Well, yeah, I mean, I agree, but I go back to what Hubbard said earlier. I mean, you just can't – I mean, you, you, you don't want to give Richardson so many opportunities. I mean, I, I don't – Florida's receivers don't scare me. Anthony Richardson from the pocket trying to find his receivers does not scare me. Anthony Richardson – breaking loose when you you know you sent six he makes two guys miss and now all of a sudden you know there's 10 yards between him and the next defender that scares me so I think you have to be judicious this week I mean I think you'd like to pressure him I think you'd like to rattle him but man I mean just having him sit back there and and try to figure out you know who's open where the windows are that that's not an ugly scenario to me you've been a pretty good tackling team through the first three games I think that's paramount this week and when you look at, you know, Anthony Richardson, the one thing that scares me is Rob pointed out, just <laughs> I just have flashbacks to Matt Corral last year who just kept converting third down after third down after third down on the ground. Here's the other thing to, to match up in the, or to watch in this matchup of the game too. I, I think Billy Napier will attack Tennessee's linebackers in the passing game with his running backs and, and, and little wide receiver screens as well. They're going to try to outnumber you out there. They're not afraid to throw that wide receiver screen. We saw it in the Utah game. Uh, given what we've seen from Tennessee and what uh, Akron did, now Akron didn't get a lot of yards out of it, but their running backs were, were active out of the backfield. I think you could see that as well. Pitt hit a screen pass on Tennessee's defense, well-timed. Um, I, I think they will try to do some things early in this game to, to make it easy on Anthony Richardson throwing the football. That's why Tennessee's got to win first down and get – get Florida into third and long situations, in my opinion. Uh, but but I would imagine Florida is going to try to get it out on the perimeter in a hurry uh, and challenge and, and stress Tennessee's linebackers in the flat. We mentioned this briefly uh, a couple of minutes ago, but I want to bring it back up in case I forgot anybody. Casey, Coach Nates, Austin Price, 
Uh, think about the recruits coming in for the Florida game. Which guys are the Vols looking at as VIPs? Of course, that would be Bison Lane, the tackle, and David Hobbs, the defensive tackle. Those guys are on official visits. Uh, any recruits leaning towards making a, des- a decision soon? No, but some other VIPs, as we mentioned, you know, uh, tw- 2024, Caleb Beasley is going to be in town. 2024, Boo Carter of Chattanooga is going to be in town. Uh, 2025, Cameron Sparks. Um, there, there's a lot. Uh, who else are some underclassmen that – uh, will be in town that Tennessee would would like to have a good showing for. Well, Sammy Brown, Brian Longwell, yeah. um, you know, th- th- there are several. Um, and, and, you know, this is, again, a, a real opportunity because the atmosphere on campus will be off the charts from tailgating at 10 a.m. to, you know, if Tennessee wins, tailgating at 10 p.m. So, you know, should be a, you know, fantastic uh, day, especially if Tennessee can get the win. Two more here, and then we're going to call it quits here on this Mobag podcast. Uh, N-W-G-A-V-O-L, with the running back room being banged up, is Jalen Wright getting the most carries on Saturday? I would say 100%. Uh, you know, he's going to be the guy that they feed it to the majority of the time. Anybody else? I mean, I know, yeah. you know, if Jabari Small plays, sure, but I think Jalen Wright is going to be a guy they feed it to a lot just because he's the healthiest guy. He'll play we'll more, be, in my We'll be close, EC. Yeah. Uh, and then finally – is this a game, Brent Hose, where Tennessee tries to attack the middle of the field with the tight ends? That pop pass uh, never had a bad day down the seam. Uh, with Miller, Ventro Miller, potentially being out at linebacker, seems like an opportunity time to attack uh, an aggressive Florida pass rush. Well, I mean, I think you'll try to, you know, you may see that some. I mean, what's going to be interesting is what does this passing game look like if Cedric Tillman doesn't go? Is it simply move Brew over and you do everything that you typically do and, and, and you kind of stay status quo? Or, or do they pull out some new stuff this week and, and attack things a little bit different by, if they don't have Cedric Tillman? So um, I, I think if Tillman's not on the field, then I think you could see Tennessee being a little more unique in the passing game and, and doing some things different. I love the slant to Jalen Hyatt. I know he ran away from everybody. He's not going to run away from Florida. I wish Tennessee would throw more slants because I think it's the hardest pass to defend when you have a rush coming. Um, so I would love to see them attack the middle of the field with the slant because I think they've got the receivers who can get inside defenders who are nice targets against the slant. I think McCoy could run a good slant. Jalen Hyatt can be a good slant guy for sure. Um, I, I think, you know, they, they've just got some guys with some size who can do some things inside with the slant. Florida does have a cornerback, a backup cornerback. They play four corners, by the way. I think his name is Nimber. He picked off a slant against Southern Florida, I believe, and, I nearly took it to the house. But uh, one other thing, the white sand does bring this up. Um, and Brent, you you mentioned this on the Rocky Top Roundtable earlier this week. Uh, Hooker, expecting Hooker to get some runs and run the football to help Tennessee's offense in this game. Well, I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, you know, we, we heard it last year. They wanted to run him more had he been healthy. Um, they could not run him Alabama and some other games because he wasn't healthy. We saw what they wanted to do and what they did do with him against Pittsburgh when they felt like he was their best option in the run game. Uh, We saw Florida struggle against the run against Utah. Their quarterback ran the ball decently, and then we saw South Florida's quarterback run the ball decently. So you want to give Hooker his opportunities to run the ball, and I think he'll get him. I think the Hooker's got to be mature in running the football. Get out of bounds when you can. Slide when you can. Don't fight for two extra yards every time you run the football and open yourself up to a big hit. If it, you know, if it's a goal line situation, if it's third and six, and you're trying to, you know, trying to get a first down, I get all of that. But when you have the opportunity to slide, and situationally it makes sense to slide, he's got to learn to get down and protect himself. That's Brent Hubs, Austin Price, Rob Lewis. I am Eric Kane, and this has been the Volquest Mailbag Podcast. Tennessee and Florida. Coming up in just two days, the stage is set, and we've got all the coverage leading up to the matchup, during the matchup, and post-game uh, throughout the next 24 hours, all at VolQuest.com. If you haven't already, $1 for one year. The deal will not last forever, but it's a good deal, so take advantage of it. Get complete coverage of Tennessee and Florida by signing up for VolQuest $1 for one year for just $1. And as always, like this video on YouTube. Subscribe if you haven't already, VolQuest on YouTube. Guys, appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us here for the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. We'll be back again with some predictions and some other matchup pieces before kickoff right here at VolQuest.com. You've been listening to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. Every week, 
right here on VolQuest.